Amen, amen, and thank you. And we want to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. And today, if you will just stand for a minute, <clears throat> and we want to welcome the reason for the season, the reason why we're here. Let's put our hands together and welcome our Lord Jesus himself. Let's welcome him to just take his place on the throne of our lives. Amen. And Father, we welcome your presence. We welcome your Son to sit on the throne of our lives. We welcome the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be here. The anointing to lift off every, every distraction. The anointing to lift off every sense of tiredness. The anointing that will just bring, Lord, your presence into our midst. Your life into our midst, Lord. And as we look to you right now, Jesus, we ask you, let the Holy Spirit just sweep over each and every one of us. Let the Holy Spirit open our ears that we can hear what He wants to say to us this morning. Open our hearts to receive and open our eyes to hear. So we give you thanks. We give you praise right now. In your name we pray. And the people shout aloud, Amen and Amen and Amen. Please be seated in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Today I'm going to talk about a season of a new dawning, a new beginning. And even as I ponder, you know, if you look in the Bible, this is a very interesting book. And you find that the Bible is divided into two parts. And between these two parts, there is a very plain single white sheet. This white sheet that divides the Bible. Every Bible would have this plain, single white sheet. Inconsequential, you may say. But yet, between this, there were two books. The book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. And between these two books, this single white sheet had a tremendous significance. It stood for 400 years. From the book of Malachi, the last chapter to the book of Matthew itself, for 400 years, there was silence. Silence. No word from the Lord. No voice declaring God's word. Not one word from the Holy Spirit has God forgotten. 400 years of human existence, of history, generations that were born and generations that were died. Babies, even as they come to this world, lives were lived and lives were lost. Wars were fought, armies came and armies left. 400 years of waiting. And four is a very significant word, a, by, figure, a number in the Bible. I'm not going to go into four, the number, but enough to say that while people lived and people waited, in Israel they waited for the coming of the Messiah. The prophets have spoken, the word of God has been given. And they waited and they waited. People became impatient. People became disappointed. People counted on God's goodness. But disappointment began to overcome. And we have, how many know, a sly enemy, the devil. He always comes to bring deception. He always comes to bring counterfeit. And in this 400 years of waiting, he came in the counterfeit of an institution called religion. You see, right from the beginning of time, if you read this Bible itself, God had a plan. And in the creation of humanity, the plan was grounded in one thing and one thing alone, God's relationship with his 
people. The creator and creation. And even in the first creation, the first man created, placed and put in a garden. Yet God came daily in the cool of the day to fellowship, to talk to him, to build that relationship. 400 years now. Israel has seen the fervent desire of faithfulness. We see stories of reliant upon God and Holy Spirit. We saw the first verse of King David who danced even naked before the Lord. Such fervency was soon to be clouded. Yes, they hoped, they waited. There was a promise of the coming of the Messiah. But in his 400 years, they waited. And they waited. And in this, religious practices began to come in. Instead of the essence of religious truth and reality, they settled for second best. They had a priesthood. And the priesthood added to all this with rituals, rituals, and rituals. Law after law. More was added. Larger ceremonies. More elaborate rituals. Greater demands on the people. And the fervent faith of Israel was distracted. It soon dissolved into reliance upon man-made rules and practices. Very soon, God did not seem to exist in all this. Very soon, people profess the holy name of God, but yet, they forgot God. Priests, rabbis, Learned lawyers became like blind guides. The religious people led the people into ditches of their own design, I call it. The result, when Jesus came, when the Messiah himself came as an ordinary baby, they not only could not recognize him, they could not accept him because he deferred from their form and their idea of who the Messiah should be. And they would not receive him. And the Bible records that when Jesus even entered into his hometown of Nazareth, they would not hear him. They threatened to stone him. When Jesus preached in their synagogues. The religious could not, people could not accept, and they raged. Even when Jesus said, these very words speak of me. Familiarity. Familiarity, the word of God tells us, was there. The people of Nazareth was familiar with Jesus because they saw him growing up in the midst. Familiarity as we also sometimes grow up with religion. I can remember because I was born in a Christian family. I was born with a Christian heritage. I was born with all the Christian practices. Went through Sunday school, sang as a choir boy. But I want to tell you something. I knew all about him. But yet, I was like those in a time before the coming of the Messiah itself. Knew all about the Messiah, but yet could not accept the Messiah. I want to say something right now, even as we celebrate Christmas today. We celebrate even a new age and a new move of God. I call it a new dawning is here right now. And a new dawning begins with the old ending. The Old Testament ended. 
a new testament began. <clears throat> and today as we celebrate Christmas, I just want to remind each and every one of us, we are right now between two chapters. Two chapters of the very word of God himself. The first chapter was about the coming of Jesus Christ. And we see it spoken about in the first four books of the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. We hear the words of John 3, 16, that therefore God so loved the world that he gave. And this is where the new dawning begins. It began with a gift. And God gave. God gave a part of himself. A seed conceived by the Holy Spirit. A seed placed into the line of men. A seed be birthed out in the line of sinful men, but yet a seed without sin. So loved that he gave the best, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. And God has sent his son, the Bible says, into this world, not to condemn this world, but that the world through him might be saved. Important ingredient that reminds us the need to be saved. And of course, the question I always ponder, what are we to be saved from? What are we to be saved for? And what are we to be saved to? But between the first coming of Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection and his ascension, there is a promise. The promise of his second coming. And if you read the word of God, over 100 verses in his Bible talk about this parousia, about his second coming, about the promise that the time of Emmanuel when Christ came and God is with men. A second coming of Christ. But it has been since Christ died in AD, about AD 33. And the outpouring of the promise of the Father, the giving of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the revival of a people to be called people of God. But 2,000 years has gone by. Israel faced 400 years of silence. We face 2,000 years of His presence. But as that 400 years brought unbelief, today, we have also much unbelief. 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10 reminds us something. It says, be not ignorant of one thing. That one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And as a thousand years one day. And the one thing that we must remember, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. The Lord will not forget His promise as some men would count slackness, says the Bible. But God has been long-suffering to us, word. He has not been willing that any should perish, but I thought we were saved. But the Apostle Peter is speaking to believers. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come into repentance. I thought as believers, 
we are saved because we repented. We believed. And like the eight here were baptized. The baptism is so significant. It's not only the cleansing of the past. It's not only the mark of our repentance. It's not only a baptism of priesthood, but it's a baptism into the very death, resurrection of our Lord. As they went under the water and as they were raised, they were raised to a newness of life. But how many know that it's one thing to be raised to a newness of life? But another thing to live that newness of life. But God is not slack. He wants all to come into repentance. Repentance does not talk about feeling sorry about things you've done. That's remorse. Repentance is when you have realized that the life you have lived is horrible, that you need a change. Repentance is when you turn away from the old life, but not just turn away. Too often we turn away and keep on turning and keep on turning and keep on turning until we're back to where we started. But Jesus is coming back again and is looking for sons and daughters. Birth for a destiny. Birth not only to turn away from that sinful life of the past, not only to turn completely to face the other way, but as Paul would challenge us, that we should begin to walk in that newness of life. But as I look at the church today, we must understand, maybe we waited too long. For 2,000 years, and many have said, He's not coming back again. He's already here. But the Word of God reminds us. By the day of the Lord, says Peter, shall come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. I want to sound a caution here. The word of God is God. John 1 1 tells us in the beginning was the word, and the word is God. And in him was all things created. Without him was nothing created. His word had become flesh and his word had dwelt upon us. And we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should say sorry to anyone. Has God said it? Will he not do it? Has God spoken? Will he not make it good? Numbers 23, verse 19. <clears throat> and yes, the time is coming. God's word is coming to pass. A new dawning is there. You know, when I read this verse about the heavens shall pass away, it's not the end of the world. It's the end of this season. But you know, in this, I saw a revelation which... Almost 70 years of my life, I couldn't understand. It was only recently as I was before the Lord <clears throat> trying to understand, as even as I was preparing for this new year coming, Lord began to show me that His Word would truly come to pass. The Word speaks <clears throat> of wars and rumors of wars. Global wars that are becoming more and more global. Wars that are becoming nuclear. There'll be nowhere else you can run and hide. There is a war that's coming because certain things must come to pass. Without the war, 
the one world leader won't come as a man to bring peace, false peace. And in this verse, as I was meditating, <clears throat> the Lord asked me a question. We entered an era <clears throat> when bombs were created. We entered another era. And I said, what was the era? When the bombs became nuclear. <clears throat> and in this verse, the Lord reminded me. He said, check out what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that's the first time a nuclear bomb was dropped. And you know what's different from nuclear bombs and other bombs? Other bombs detonate when they hit the earth. But the nuclear bomb detonates 600 meters above the ground. And when it does, it comes with such a loud noise, such a heat, such a radiation, that literally things melted. You know, after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they found that people who were just dissolved by the heat, that even their shadows were just burned into the ground. The heat was so intense. And as I read this, the earth also and the works, the works not of God but the works of men shall also be burned up. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 reminds us that to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. You know, I would encourage you, if you've got time, read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, and understand the poetic significance of what God is trying to remind us. <clears throat> As you do that, meditate. What season are we in right now? As we prepare to celebrate this Christmas, what season are we in? after 2,000 years of Christian history, where are we? We need to be wise and aware to certain facts again. I'm not going to preach on eschatology. I'm not going to preach on end times. But we must realise we have entered a season called the end times. And the end times began when Jesus died. And Jesus was raised from death when he ascended and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. If he did not know it, we have entered the end times. But we also must aware that we are now in a very critical part of this season called the end times. We are right now and the first hint was given us to, by Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, when he was told by God to seal up this for that very last day itself. And two signs that people run to and fro and knowledge increased. Do you know knowledge has increased tremendously over this last 120 years, especially very much so in our lifetime today. We've seen the first computer. We've seen computing come into being. We've moved in a digital age. Do you know we've moved beyond the digital age into artificial intelligence now? We're moving, we already moved into augmented reality. And very soon, holographic, holographics will become a way of life. The little computer they have in a pocket going 5G very soon. It'll be more powerful than most desktops. Have you, do you know what season we're in right now? And 2 Timothy chapter 3 warns us something. This know also, and here comes the words, that in the last days, Perilous times shall come. And I would encourage you to read that chapter. For people become lovers of themselves. People become what? Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous, disobedient, 
to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural attraction, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despises of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but deny the very power of God. Today, we who believe in God, how many really trust? Trust and completely rely on Him. I want to tell you we are on a threshold right now in these last days of a season of a great falling away. In Genesis chapter 15, 16, when God spoke to Abraham way back then before even Jesus about his seed going into captivity for 400 years and they will come out, but yet, not yet, until the iniquities of the Amorites overflow. I don't know whether you're aware of it. Right now, the iniquities of the Amorites are overflowing. You know the iniquities of the Amorites started with incestuous relation between Lot and a daughter. Amon was a result of one of the sons of that incestuous relationship. But if you study the Amorites, the line of Amorites is about birth in incest, prosper in lawlessness. Do you not know that we are in lawless times today? When people will call good evil and evil good. When people would deny the word of God and say the love of God permits and understands. People, we have tried to take God and made him as what Israel made of him. Nothing but rituals, nothing but our own righteousness. Jesus said to them, you are like self curse nice outside, but dead bones inside. Have we examined ourselves? Matthew 24, 24, Jesus himself warned us that at that time is so perilous that even the elect will get deceived. We're now in the final wave of God. And I want to tell you, Jesus is coming back. The Word of God, God is not slack, as people would count slackness. And there's only one thing that Jesus left for His disciples. A time, He said, if this end does not come early, even the elect has no hope. But in Matthew 24, 14, He said, and the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in a world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end of this age as we know it end. Jesus is come back. And the word of God challenges us to be occupied to doing the things that he wants us to do. Today there's so much deception, there's so much distraction. We are so caught up with things of the world. Today, we hear nothing but pandemic, pandemic, pandemic. Oh, global meltdown is coming, global. It has to come. God is still in control in this pandemic. I mean, even what is happening right now towards the end of this world, it was something that God said to me, and if you go to our website last year, I already said it this year, towards the end of this year, a new pandemic variant will come. And it's here. But why are we panicking? We have Omicron, yes. But we have the omnipotence with us. Amen. If God be with us, 
who can come against us. Don't let unbelief steal that. Don't let distractions take that away. Don't let the downturn, don't let life, don't let living. Don't get caught by all the wrong things. But do what they did in Mark 16, 20 when Jesus gave them the final word. It says, and they went forth, they preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them confirming the word with signs and miracles following. Our God is the same God yesterday, the same God today and the same God forever. Second Timothy reminds us not to be caught by this falling away. In chapter 4, verse 2 to 5, he says, Preach the word. Be instant in every season. Out of season. <laughs> Reprove, rebuke, exhort. With all long, long suffering and doctrine, very important. For the time will come when people will not even endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, they shall heap unto themselves teachers, having itches each years, wanting to hear what they want to hear. Today is an era of hyper things, hyper faith, hyper prosperity, hyper gospel, hyper grace, hyper, hyper, hyper. We got hyper marks as well. <laughs> but we must understand. In all this, 2 Timothy 4 says, in verse 5, uh, in verse 4, but they shall turn away their years from the truth and they should turn into believing fables. Do you know what fables? <laughs> Urban legends, <laughs> stories. You get deceived. So much deception today. You know, God has been trying to warn us and warn us with the online, with the internet, all the fake news, all the scams, all the this, the that, so many things. And yet, we are guided not by the Word of God, but by what is on online. And there's always fear. But God has not given us a spirit of bondage of fear, but of love and a power and a disciplined mind. Are we so scatterbrained? What is our responsibility today between the two chapters that we are facing, the first coming of the Lord and the second coming? Tricia, remind us, every time Israel celebrated the Passover meal before that, they celebrated their deliverance from Egypt and they look forward to the coming of the Messiah. And they still look forward to that. Even when they were scattered, their hope was next year in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. But we, the Lord has come, the Messiah has come. We celebrate not only His crucifixion, we celebrate His second coming. And it is first our responsibility, I want to say to each and every one of you, on site, in the online, is listening. Our responsibility is to ensure that history does not repeat itself. That new dawning, and as much as there's a falling away, there's a fresh revival. There's a final wave of God that's going to come. And it's going to be a word-based, it's going to be a spirit-led, it's going to be a faith-filled move of God. Take the example of Mary. Mary, I always call her the beautiful Jesus lover. Mary that chose to sit at her feet, experiencing spiritual revival, while Martha was distracted in her services. But you know something? Mary was also distracted when she lost her beloved brother. Of course, she knew that Jesus was the Savior. 
She knew Jesus could save people from sin. But when it came to a critical moment, she could only remember Jesus as a teacher that performed miracles. Her very words she said to him, Lord, if, if you had been here, you could have done a miracle, in other words, my brother would not have died. She saw death as the end to the brother. She could not understand that when you have the Lord as your shepherd, no lack exists. But you know her perspective changed after the resurrection of her brother? And she did the most biggest sacrifice of all. I'm not going to preach about Mary. But we must remember right now, we are between the first coming. We are between the second coming. Two hours are now offered before you. Religion or revival. We need to constantly search our hearts. We need to deal with a death that's necessary. The death to the things of the world, the death to love of the things of the world. The death to anything that will gain access to the throne of our lives. We need to keep our focus that Jesus is coming back. Don't keep your eye on the church. I hear too much about the church. But I'm sorry to say that we're almost like in a post-Christian era. The church has become very ecclesiastical in a lot of churches, organized, structured. We're able to run everything, right down to run sheets, everything. I'm not saying that's bad, don't get me wrong. But we can so, be so well organized that we don't need God anymore. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> Right? We've got times, we've got this, we've got time, everything to keep. Very important, we just do the rituals. Yes, every week we celebrate communion. We celebrate not because it's a ritual, we celebrate because Jesus said, as often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of Him. We do it because we want to keep Jesus alive. We do it because we are reminded by what He said in Luke 18, chapter, verse 8. When he said with sorrow, nevertheless, when a son of man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Will the faithful still have faith? Or the faithful will be faithless? And today we are caught in that wrong love affair now. I'm mindful of time, and I want to end this we're just a reminder. Our attitude is important as you wait for the second coming. We need to be fervent. We need to have that actual rejoicing. And I'll leave this first for you to think about, to meditate. Write it down, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. Keep our attitude correct and the way we live our lives, even in this community. Keep your eyes upon Jesus as the author and finisher of faith. Keep your eyes to know that only in Him alone can we live, can we move and live as a community and have our persona of Christian inwardness and not just Christian lifestyle outwardly. We need to align the hearts and prepare for the fresh second coming of the Lord. We need to remove, even right now, every seed of re religion. Everything that seems to represent God. Even knowledge. People are prideful knowledge. People want to go and, go and get degrees after degrees where well, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to prepare our community. And I'll be talking more about it on the first service in January, where we as a church 
will next year be preparing ourselves as a church to be Christ-like in all things, to put Christ back center into our lives, to put Christ back center in our community, to put Christ center back in the church. We will start the year next year, and I will be talking more about it from January the 10th to February the 28th to a 40 day of devotion as we will answer certain basic questions. First one, what are we here on earth for? <laughs> basic questions. Five basic questions in that 40 days before we hit Lent. And pastors and our leaders have met, we have rolled out this thing. And I want to tell you this, we will do it. And we as a church, we want to go back on the cutting edge by preparing each and every member of our community here so that this community can be ready. Ready and prepared. But more than that, we want to be on the cutting edge for Jesus. You're going to hear about the Alpha program and you're going to hear about, we'll start with Christmas, bringing somebody to Jesus. We're going to give you a challenge. Pastor Trisha has talked about it. Just set your focus. Bring at least one for Jesus. Start with that, one. One, not too hard. Start with one. And multiply with that. So I close with this. We are now between the two chapters. The first coming and the second coming. We are now in the last days. We are now in the final plan and move of God. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted by COVID. Don't get distracted arguing about this and arguing about that, arguing about vaccines. I, I mean, it's good to be knowledgeable. But let's get our priorities right. Will you trust God? Will you believe in Him? Will you set your life and vision to align and be centered with Him? If you are, as I close this, I'm going to give a challenge. How many of you say, I am? I'm ready. I want to make the commitment. If that's you, just raise your hand to the Lord, whether you're online, on-site. Just raise your hand and just wave it to the Lord. And that's your commitment. And join us as we move forward. Don't just wave the hand for the sake of waving it. I said a hand of commitment. A hand to join us the next year. Two, zero, two, zero. Two, zero, Oh, well, 2022. Two, two. <laughs> three twos, okay. <laughs> you know, three twos add up to six. Six is the more men. Six is the time that we as men must begin to rise up and be counted and be found doing when Christ returns. That's quite enough, us. Father, I give you glory, I give you thanks, I give you praise. All that we have, all that I have, all that we are and all that I am, Lord, it would not exist but for you. I pray right now for every, each and every one who has heard this message, that their hearts will be aligned to you, God, to your heartbeat, that our eyes will be focused on Jesus, that we can truly rise up as men and women, <clears throat> men and women of destiny, men and women of significance, men and women ready, Lord, ready for you. So I give thanks, I give you praise for each and every one that's lifted the hand. That's our commitment, Lord. Holy Spirit, you've seen the hand, you've seen the heart. I give you thanks, I give you praise. Let your anointing fall. 
let your presence be manifested in our life. Help us not be distracted. Next year, Lord, we want to be a people that will be able to reconcile, a people that's ever to move in restoration and restitution, but a people that would also come in godly repentance. So, Father, we commit it all to you right now. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Give a clap offering to God. Hallelujah. Amen.